19, sorry, I should have waited a few seconds. In 1983, Robert Duvall had an idea for a movie, but he couldn't quite decide how to make it, and so he literally took 15 years, he made it with his own money, and in 1998, it became very successful blockbuster, The Apostle. In it, he wanted to portray a preacher who was fully human, sinful, with all kinds of propensities, and yet he was indwelled and moved by the Holy Spirit. Some of you probably remember that film with Robert Duvall playing the Apostle. He wanted to represent this understanding of how Holy Spirit moves in American religion. Because there's no church out there that does not invoke in some way the Holy Spirit. In some churches, it's just ridiculous. Where people roll on the floor and bark like dogs and do all kinds of things and claim that the Holy Spirit makes them do it. Other churches barely even mention the word of Holy Spirit because they go to another extreme that they are not comfortable to talk about these charismatic things. Before I get on the subject, I think I must read these two quotations so that way it's not my words, but you take someone that we all respect a lot, someone who played an important role in our movement, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some call her lovingly Auntie Ellen. For others, she's Sister White. Ellen Gould White. She penned these words. Let human beings consider that by all their searchings, they can never interpret God. When the redeemed shall be pure and clean to come into his presence, they will understand that all that has reference to eternal God, the unapproachable God, cannot be represented in figures. Did you hear that? Cannot be represented in metaphors. Today, as we study at the back, people were asking, Pastor, what is the metaphor? Give us the metaphor. Did you hear that statement? You cannot limit God to figures, to human metaphors. It is safe to contemplate God, the great and wonderful God, and Jesus Christ, the expressed image of God. God gave him his only begotten Son to our world, that we may, through his righteous character, behold the character of God. In heaven, we shall be in the eternal presence of God. And now says this, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptable of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. So today I'm not going to attempt to explain you what and who and how the Holy Spirit works. I would simply take you to the Bible that you would see examples of Holy Spirit work in lives of people through antiquity and hopefully as you would catch the glimpse of how Holy Spirit worked, you would get excited to give a chance for the Holy Spirit to work in you. The first thing God instructed Moses and Israel as they left the captivity says, I want you to build me a sanctuary for what purpose? That I may dwell with you. It has always been God's desire for him to dwell with his people. And so when that tabernacle was dedicated, something significant happened. A glory descended, Shekinah glory descended and dwelled there. And every time Moses went back, he was refreshed, rejuvenated. As we study together 2 Corinthians, we look at chapter 3 at the fact that Moses put a veil over his face. Are you aware of that? And many people misinterpret that. They suggest that his face was shining so bright that people couldn't look at him, and so they just want him to cover it up. When you actually open the Bible, go with me there to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you would see a bit different story. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And just look at this verse. 
verse 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, listen to this, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Did you get that? The glory was passing away and Moses was hiding behind the veil because if they would come and see him, they would see that it's less and less shiny day after day. The glory was passing away. And that's why he would rush to the sanctuary where he could recharge again the glory. And so when you read that chapter, Paul is saying this. The Holy Spirit, who wrote the Ten Commandments, the finger of God, those things were glorious, but that glory was fading away. How much more glorious would be not to have just the Ten Commandments on a wall, but to have the same Holy Spirit that wrote the Ten Commandments write the law of God now in your heart, the same Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Paul was inviting them to the life of glory. And so in that chapter, he invites them to consider, look at the end of the chapter, verse 18. We all, with unveiled face, beholding us in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul was inviting them to consider that instead of coming and bowing before the Ten Commandments written by the Holy Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to be present in them. For the Holy Spirit, for the presence of God to dwell in them so they would be transformed from glory to glory. Are you getting this? Kids were talking last night about spiritual gifts and they were all over the place and I'm not going to repeat some of the concepts that they were sharing. But let me invite you to consider this. That there are many people in the past who had the Holy Spirit, who were not really righteous people. Are you aware of that? Could you consider some names before I start giving them to you? Samson. How righteous was he? Man, you all know Samson. If a girl walks by and she's pretty, you know Samson's trouble, right? When I was... Some men are shaking their hands. No, not my problem. When I was growing up, my father told me, son... You're not stronger than Samson and not wiser than Solomon. Samson. And yet, when the Holy Spirit would descend on him, he would do great things. Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 14. Look at verse 6. I said to the kids, what if Samson was not a big, great guy? We always picture Samson as this mighty giant. Associate his strength with his muscles. What if he was just a small scrawny guy whose strength was not in his muscles, but in the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't want to speculate, but look at this. Book of Judges, chapter 14. Look at verse 6. I'll read verse 5. So Samson went down to Timnah, that's the Philistine town. Why did he go there? Well, you could guess. To see a girl. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he tore the lion apart. Imagine that gift. Holy Spirit descending on him for one purpose. To rip the lion apart. Now, think of Samson. Through his life story, and right now there's a new film produced. I know there's a lot of artistic license there. But through all his life, was his power in his muscles? Because he was working out. He was pumping the iron. Where was his power and strength coming from? The hair. You think the hair, really? The hair was a symbol. It was a token. The Holy Spirit descended on him and empowered him. I'll give you other individuals in the Bible. King Saul. Was he ever filled with the Spirit? Yes. yes. The Holy Spirit would descend on King Saul mightily and he would do great things. When you read 1 Samuel eleven six, the Holy Spirit came mightily on Saul and his anger was greatly aroused. Holy Spirit, work. Now I'll give you another name. Do you remember Balaam? Was he a good guy? Really? 
I mean, he saw angels, he talked to a donkey, or his donkey rather talked. So I'm not sure who talked to who. But Balaam led Israel into all kind of apostasies, and yet, you read verse 2 of Numbers 24. It says, Spirit of God came upon Balaam. I'm illustrating this because I want you to understand that Holy Spirit could use and uses all kind of people. David, with all his problems, was mightily used by God, and the Holy Spirit would descend upon him. I want you to get this. Throughout the history, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was present. From Genesis 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. You read the Holy Spirit there, read the Bible, there's always Holy Spirit present. I just wanted to get this straight. But there was something that happened with Jesus coming on this earth. Go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 7, and look at this puzzling passage. Jesus stands there on the day of temple dedication, and he utters these words. John chapter 7, I read from verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who has believed in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning what? The Spirit, whom those believing in Him would receive. What tense is that? Future tense. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I want you to notice this. That even though Holy Spirit was working in the world, even though Holy Spirit would descend from time to time mightily upon people and use them for God's purpose. There was something yet much greater to come. Until Jesus was glorified, the Holy Spirit work in this world was partial. And it's after Jesus' death and resurrection that the Holy Spirit descended in a whole different way. That day when the Holy Spirit descended on the church, how do we call that day? Day of Pentecost. And we all look wistfully back on the day of Pentecost when church was so powerful that Peter got out there, preached for a short while, and how many people were baptized? Do you remember? 3,000 were baptized. We're calling that the early rain, and we're praying for the latter rain. We're waiting for the Holy Spirit revival. We're saying, God, we want you to descend, want you to come, want you to take over that we would experience that latter rain. How many of you want to experience the Holy Spirit in your life? Is it your desire? Now, what's preventing us from having that experience? Because you've seen already that Samson was not righteous, David was not righteous, Balaam was not righteous, because people say, well, you have to get your life in order. You have to become perfect before you receive the Holy Spirit. I'm just giving you a few examples, and if we would have more time, I would go on and on and on with examples of people who were not perfect, and yet the Holy Spirit used them. So what is it that preventing us being used by the Holy Spirit? You're thinking now, and I hope you're thinking deep. In fact, we need the Holy Spirit, because without the Holy Spirit, we cannot even understand this Bible. You go with me to Psalm 36. Take a look at this Psalm. Psalm 36, verse 9. David is speaking of the Holy Spirit, and he says something powerful here. Psalm 36, verse 9. says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Did you get that? In your light we see light. He's alluding to this metaphor that when you walk into the most holy place, before you proceed into the most holy, you walk into the holy place, and there would be menorah. If you've seen pictures or done your studies of the sanctuary, let me ask you, were there windows in the tabernacle? No. How was it illumined? What was the source of light there? Menorah, which was the symbol of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, without Holy Spirit, there's total darkness. We cannot see anything. 
So it's in your light that we see light. The Holy Spirit is the light that illumines even the scripture to us. Could it be that we do not understand what to expect and we miss sometimes Holy Spirit already working in our lives? Could it be that the Holy Spirit is present working with you and wants to take you to the next step, but because you are not sure what's happening, you pull the brakes? I remember talking to a young person, a youth group was meeting Friday night, and they were giving testimonies, sharing what's happening in their lives, and this young person got up and walked out. She was very upset. She says, I just can't stand this. All of them sharing their testimony. Nothing is happening in my life. I say, really? Because see, the night before, and I'm talking 90s, long time ago, Friday night, Good Island's girl, she's known better. She was going with her girlfriends to NSYNC concert in Toronto. 90s, I'm talking 90s. I know some of you don't even remember that that group existed. And they rolled their vehicle. She borrowed her parents' Ford Aerostar, and going in Burlington, that bridge, you know, near Hamilton, they roll the vehicle. Friday afternoon, going to this concert. Not a scratch, no injury. They were on the highway going 110. And a week later, she's saying, the Holy Spirit is not working in my life. Do you see a problem there? I said to her, do not let devil rob the experiences of Holy Spirit in your life. Many of us have incredible things happening in our lives, but we discard it as coincidence. We discard it as something else instead of recognizing that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. I use this illustration for the work of Holy Spirit. A cup or a glass. Someone comes in your home and asks you for a glass of water. You either reach for the clean one that's been washed, right, and fill it, or you reach into the sink where there are a lot of glasses, and you do what? You wash it. And so as the water is running around that glass, that's the work of Holy Spirit in our lives. But not until it's completely washed and set upright that it could be filled. The Holy Spirit is already working in your lives. The fact that you're here this morning is the evidence that the Holy Spirit brought you here. So when we begin to appreciate the work of Holy Spirit in the present moment, recognizing that the Holy Spirit works with us already, then we become ready for more. Apostle Paul says that we can't even pray unless what? The Holy Spirit who searches our hearts and knows everything prompts us to pray. You read Romans chapter 8 verse 26 and 27. So if you pray today, then guess what? The Holy Spirit already worked with you in your life. Because you're praying by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that intercedes for us. I want you to recognize that you're not void of those experiences. Mercies drops round us falling. But for the showers we plead. If you really want the shower, then start appreciating those drops of mercy, the drops of Holy Spirit already working in our lives. Now, recognize that when Jesus was here, he was here to preach and proclaim his kingdom. He would begin his sermons saying, the kingdom of God is upon you. The kingdom of God is near you. I come to preach this kingdom of God. Sounds familiar? Look at this passage, Matthew 12, 28. It says, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. It's interesting that Jesus associated the work of Holy Spirit with that spirit of liberation, setting captives free, releasing people from their oppression, from their burdens, from whatever was besetting them. Is Holy Spirit doing something in your life? Is Holy Spirit setting you free from whatever it may be that stands between you and God? That be stands between you and someone in your family. Some people say, Pastor, I understand Father, I understand the Son, but this Holy Spirit business is so vague. What is His name? I literally had people ask me, okay, Pastor, what is the Holy Spirit name? Now, you open the Gospel of John chapter 4 and take a look at verse 34. Go with me. Gospel of John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus 
says this. Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. And you know what? I was referring to the letter of John, not to the gospel of John. Sorry. Go with me to the letter of John. 1 John chapter 4. Where God is spirit. God himself is a spirit that describes the nature, the purest essence of God. And Apostle Paul would say where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Are you aware of that? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Now the work of Holy Spirit is to bring us into freedom, into liberty. Not to dictate, not to control, not to do things that against our will, but to bring us to recognition of what he wants to do, to communicate that will of God. Now, let me use this illustration. In our lives, we use power all the time. You walk into a room that is dark, what do you do first thing? You flip the switch. What's behind that switch? Electricity. Is it powerful? Yes, very powerful. Do you talk to it? Do you say, dear electricity, may I turn you on? No, why? It's a power, but it's not a person. It's not personal power. You don't have to have dialogue with the power that is not personal. You just flip the switch. When it comes to Holy Spirit, some people treat it as if it is a power that they could possess, that they could tell, and that they could manipulate. You know, it's always been desire of others to control God. From devil trying to tell God what to do, to people who want to manipulate God, make God predictable, and control Him in their own way. And yet, God cannot be controlled because God is God. He is spirit. With spirit comes liberty. And so when we come to God, when we come to Holy Spirit, we need to understand that Holy Spirit is a person. He has a mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 12 to 16, Apostle Paul is talking about the fact that there are people who do not understand the mind of God. But he concludes there to say, verse 13, the Holy Spirit searches, teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ the Holy Spirit has feelings he could be offended the Holy Spirit makes his own choices and decisions and decides as he wills when you read about spiritual gifts in 1st Corinthians chapter 12 verse 11 it says spirit gives gifts as he wills so where am i going with this jesus before he left he looks at his disciples and he tells them it's better for you that i go because when i go i will send you the holy spirit he says i will not leave you orphans i would send you comforter and i want to pause here for a second because Jesus, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, promises another helper, implying that he is the first comforter, that he is the first helper. When you read the passages today, when we read the scripture, from both Malachi chapter 3, and then we move to Matthew chapter 3, there is this image, there is this picture of God who is purifying God who has a refiner's fire in which he purifies us. And John says, the one who comes after me will baptize you with the spirit and the fire. To connect this, now Jesus, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, says that I will send the Holy Spirit. And notice chapter 16 from verse 8 says, when he has come, 
he will convict the world of sin. The first work of Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. A young person asked me, Pastor, what does it mean, the fire, the baptism by fire? Do we need to be baptized the third time? Baptized by water, then by the Spirit, and then by the fire. When you start reading, you realize Gospels describe the same event in these dual metaphors. You're baptized by the Spirit and by fire. When you put these pictures together, God's refining fire is pointing out two things in our lives that need to be removed. First work of the Holy Spirit is what? To convict the world of sin. Do you like it? Do you want anyone to come and convict you of your sins? I'm asking because there's a lot of deception about the work of Holy Spirit. Many people zoom in on this word comforter, ignoring the fact that, well, this is just an English translation. Because the Greek word behind is paraclete, parakletos, the one who comes along. And that's not so much comforter. Yes, if you need help and someone comes along and holds your hand, that's comforting. You ever been in difficulty that you wish someone would come along and hold your hand? If you ever done a project that you weren't sure what to do and someone came who's more experienced, who guided you through, then you felt great. But sometimes if someone comes along and says, could I walk along with you? You may feel like, no, because I don't want you to know my trash. I don't want you to know what I'm up to. Let me ask you straight. Are you comfortable for the Holy Spirit to walk with you 24-7? Amen? Are you comfortable for Jesus to sit beside you as a passenger 24-7? Hope so. I hear adults saying yes and amen, but young people are somehow quiet today. We talk about the omnipresent God. That means He is present where? Everywhere. Omnipresent God. I remember as a young boy watching a film back home in Ukraine, and uh, it was an Orthodox family. And in Russian Orthodox families, in every corner, the, in every house, there's a special corner with icons there. We call it iconostas. So the icons are standing there. And so this young lady was doing what she was not supposed to be doing. She walks in her room, and you know what she does? She takes the icon and turns it upside down, puts it down, and covers it so Jesus is not going to see what she's up to. And that's how we treat sometimes the Holy Spirit. I remember when my Sammy, he was the baby and we loved him and he was always with us, baby, and hugged. Older brothers, if they want to do trouble, they would hide. Stepan was the sneaky one, so if he gets quiet all of a sudden, you better go check on him to see what he's up to. But Sammy would sit right in front of us, would be sitting with Sandra on the couch, and he would say, Mommy, Daddy, close your eyes. Before he would to do something he knows he shouldn't do. Either draw with, with perma marker on the floor or something else. He would ask us to close our eyes. That's how we act sometimes in our lives toward the Holy Spirit. We expect that God could close his eyes, forgetting that God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. And how is it happening? By the Holy Spirit present in this world. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go. Because as long as Jesus was here, they were all relying on who? On Jesus. Just like today, people want pastor to come and visit here and visit there. And I'm human. I have only 24 hours a day and I need to sleep and I need to eat and I need to iron my clothes. And I need to clean my car sometimes. And there's so much paperwork piled on a desk that I don't have a secretary. I need to take at least half a day every two weeks to just go and respond to some of the letters besides daily emails and everything else. And I tell you, I understand what Jesus meant saying, it's better for you that I go. Because the Holy Spirit would come and the Holy Spirit would activate you and work in your lives, making you all do what? Work for the glory of God. And so when you consider this concept of Holy Spirit, you begin to appreciate that it is God's desire for the Holy Spirit to be in every one of us. Yes, He convicts us of sin. 
Because God and sin cannot reside in the same room together. And if Holy Spirit is the presence of God, then Holy Spirit will do something with the things that don't belong in your life. But it's the Holy Spirit, when we let Him in, changes us from inside out. That's why Paul says, for the fruits of the Spirit are... I did it on purpose to trick you. How many fruits, or is it a fruit? Singular, the fruit of the Spirit is love, which is all these things, peace, joy, kindness, meekness. These things are descriptions of what the true love is, which is produced by the Holy Spirit. And you cannot produce it yourself because it's like making plastic apples and trying to attach them to the tree. If you're trying to produce your own joy and your own peace and your own patience, good luck to you. Anyone who will take a bite will know it's fake. Unless the Holy Spirit produces from within because then it's real. And so I'm sharing this with you because we're coming to the table today. And through the centuries, there's been debates about the work of the Holy Spirit. There was a controversy once in the third century during the persecution time when certain priests and ministers betrayed the gospel. Under the fear of persecution, they walked away. Donatist controversy, it's known in history. They just could not sustain the pressure and they abandoned the faith. And many people start asking these questions. Well, I was baptized by him, and now he's abandoned the faith. Is my baptism still valid? Or I was married by that pastor, and now he's abandoned the faith. Is my marriage still valid? That was the challenge in history. Some people were saying, well, I received the communion from the minister who committed a sin, who left. Am I still in good faith? And the church grappled with that. And you know the answer the church came up with? It was going back to the scriptures, realizing it's not by our efforts or by our righteousness or by our contributions that we make something holy. But it is by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives that things are made holy. Holy Spirit make things holy. You may not be holy, but if you let the Holy Spirit to come in, He make things holy. So today we come to partake of these emblems. You may be looking at the deacons that would be serving, you may be looking at your pastor or the elders, but I invite you to consider this, that it's the Holy Spirit in your heart that will make these emblems what they are. We endeavor to prepare this occasion but it is the Holy Spirit in your heart that has to move you to your knee in humility. It's the Holy Spirit that has to move you back here after the foot washing that you may receive these emblems and through them, God's grace. The Holy Spirit, is He in your life? Is the Holy Spirit present with you? Have you immersed yourself in the Holy Spirit? If he's convicted you of sin, has he washed you to be set upright and to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Acts of Apostles, page 50, reminds us that if we are willing, all would be filled with the Spirit. How many? All. Not some, not only men, not only people of certain age, but all. Including who? Young people, children. Are we afraid to say that? Kids shall be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you open the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, when he talks about that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, go with me there. Joel, chapter 2. Little book of Joel. Chapter 2, as he talks about the latter rain and the early rain, he comes to this prophecy. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. He continues to speak of men servants and maid servants because the Holy Spirit is not limited by gender, by ethnicity, by age, or by anything. If we're willing to receive and ask, the Holy Spirit would be given to us. Apostle Paul received the Spirit when he was blinded on that road to Damascus. It was community and Ananias who come to anoint him and send him on a mission. And so my question to you, as you go through life, recognizing that Holy Spirit is working in your life, have you ever felt tags of conscience that you weren't doing something right and you should have done something differently? Come on, we're all done wrong and we know that conscience speaks to us. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. Do we obey it? Do we listen it? I let the elders preach another sermon on the unpardonable sin of denying and not obeying the Holy Spirit. Today I simply ask you to consider that Holy Spirit is already working in your life. As imperfect as we may be, as undeserving as we are, as much in the need of change as we still remain, because far be it from me that I would call myself ready, as much as I want the fruit of the Spirit to be produced in me, I know there are some other fruits that are still happening, but I want to be filled without measure. I want to ask the Holy Spirit to come into my life. And so when you ask, He will give. Because Jesus told us that God wants us to ask and He wants us to give the Holy Spirit. And so there, in Gospel of John, chapter 14, I read these words. Verse 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach all things, bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither be ye afraid. Notice that the same chapter begins with the words, let not your hearts be troubled. Whose choice is it to let the Holy Spirit in our hearts? Ours. Simple, sincere prayer. Not some kind of rituals. Not some kind of things to do. Simple and sincere prayer. Asking God, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Enter my heart. Change me from within. Cleanse me. Remove things. Pray it in your own way. Today I invite you simply to kneel wherever you are. Before we go to foot washing. For a short, silent prayer of reflection. Everyone inviting Holy Spirit in their life. Asking God to come and transform you from within. Please follow my example. And pray this quiet prayer.
Come Holy Spirit, abide in me. That Christ may grow in me. That Christ may be reproduced by the Holy Spirit in my life. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Now there are stations prepared. We ask the children to come up here for a special children's time. But we ask again quietly, reverently for men to go to their stations and for women to go to a designated area to do the foot washing before we return to the table.
want to invite you to ask God to baptize us anew as we sing together. As we sung this song, you recognize that there are few allusions to the Holy Spirit, the dove, the fire. When you go through the Bible, you would discover many, many other images of the Holy Spirit. Let me just read a few. Manna represents the Holy Spirit, the provisions of God. Salt represents the Holy Spirit. In fact, in ancient Israel, when little babies were born, they would salt them, not annoy them, not baptize them. They would salt them for a symbol of Holy Spirit in their life. Seal of God were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Dowry, down deposit, down payment, a deposit from God into our lives. Oil, ointment. Water is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. So today, as you were washing feet, you were using the symbol of Holy Spirit for humility. Bible says that God gives grace to who? You're quiet. To the humble. And so we came from that ordinance of humility. I look at the list, dew, wind, light, fire, hand the fellowship of God as you shake hands with one another it's also a symbol of Holy Spirit as you open your embrace to include someone it is the symbol of Holy Spirit eye of God finger of God voice of God the sap notice that in the Gospel of John, between chapters 14 and 16, where Jesus explains the work of Holy Spirit, he has a chapter 15 that says, Abide in me. And the illustration is given of the tree and the branches. And as the sap flows through the tree into the branches, it makes them alive. And so Holy Spirit is represented not by one, two, by many metaphors, Bible scholars say that there are over 60 metaphors in the Bible representing the Holy Spirit. Today, as we partake these emblems, we invite you to consider the work of Holy Spirit in your life because we receive the grace of God by faith. We receive God's grace as we take these emblems. 
Jesus our Lord said, I tell you sincerely, unless you fit on the Son of Man, you cannot have eternal life. But the man who believes in me and eats and drinks the spiritual food that I provided already has eternal life. And I will resurrect him on that last day. My life and my sacrificial death are foods and drinks to your souls. He who feeds on me is part of me, and I am part of him. Just as the Father in heaven sent me, I sent, I feed on him in his love for me, so the man who feeds on me and on my love for him will live because of me. I am the bread from heaven, said our Lord Jesus, and whoever feeds on this bread shall live forever. And the apostle who declared himself one who was abnormally born, the apostle Paul put it this way, recalling that wonderful day when Christ took off, took a tower, wrapped it around himself, knelt and washed the feet of, his, of the man he created. And so Paul said it this way, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And then these two verses read like this. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, said it, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of, in remembrance of me. And then verse 25 of First Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul then wrote it this way, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as, often as you drink it in remembrance of me. But this is so memorable for me and for us. Verse 26 says, for as often as you do this, how, how powerful. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Christ will come without question. Let us remember him today. Amen. Let us kneel together as we pray a blessing on these emblems. There will be two prayers, so please do not rush to get up from your feet. Our loving Father in heaven, most gracious God, how much you really love us that you did not even spare your only son, but send him to the cross that we may be saved into your kingdom. Our Savior Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. We believe that this uh, unleavened bread presented before us here represents the body of our Lord and Savior, broken for each one of us. May we ask that you please bless this, uh, this uh, bread. We also pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread, that we may be reminded of the great sacrifice that our Savior did for us on our behalf. Help us to be grateful to you forever. Help us also to be diligent to feed upon your holy word that we may be nourished and strengthened spiritually to serve you better for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father God, it is true. Dr. Tan had just mentioned your body. 
Lord, the Bible also reminds us that we still proclaim what you've done for us by your blood, remembering what you did for us, shedding your blood. Lord, centuries ago, in Egypt, slave and free, Egyptians and Hebrews heard the call to put blood on the porters of their houses. And that night, the angel came and saw blood and passed by. They were saved. Hebrews left that land along with anyone from any nation who chose to join them on a road, on a journey to the promised land, earthly promised land. Lord, today, we are not remembering blood of goats, of animals, but that of one who loved us so much that he chose to be like us for eternity, that we will watch one who looks like a brother. And so today, let it be a beginning for each one of us to look up every time difficulties come, to look up every time we are joyful, to look up every time we doubt. May this day be the beginning of a new baptism for all of us here, young and old. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 As deacons are coming to serve, I wanted to make a reminder that we will not be serving on the balcony. So AV staff, for this moment, we we'll need your support. Everything is working well. Please come down, meet deacons at the back of the sanctuary. Those who are in the balcony, if you could make your way down, please. The deacons will be serving right here on this main floor. And we don't want to be asking if everyone's been served at the end. So please make your way down here to receive your emblems from the deacons today. Also, there would be no testimonies, no music. I want you to sit quietly with that introspection, allowing the Holy Spirit to talk to you. Because sometimes we're so busy with noise, with music, with radio, with things always filling our head. We want some time of quiet silence to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we receive these emblems.
That night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, Take ye and eat. This is my body broken for you. And after that, he took a cup in the same manner, giving thanks, gave to his disciples, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. Take ye and drink. When you go to choicest places, before they serve a real meal, they give you appetizers. I want you to consider this as an appetizer, as an invitation to much greater feast. I open my Bible to Isaiah 25 and I read these words. In this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choicest pieces, a feast of wines on a lease. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people. Whatever separates us from the glory of God would be removed. And a veil that is spread over all nations. Because he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. We're looking forward to that day. When we would sit at that wedding supper of the Lamb. When all tears would be wiped away and would feast together with Lord Jesus again. I ask you to rise together as we sing our closing song, just as Jesus and disciples sung together as they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And let's reflect again on our desire for the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts.
Father God, you've heard our prayers. It is our heart's desire to be filled by your Spirit. Lord God, it's not our eloquence, for we are not able to express fully how much we need you. But it is your Spirit searching our hearts, knowing our earnest desire to be filled by your Spirit. Lord God, pour your love into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we walk out, I wanted to remind you that it is our tradition in this church to collect a special offering, love offering we call it. It is a benevolent fund for people in need. And every time we do communion, it's a different need. Something I wanted to bring before you, we have not discussed this, but we're planning to assist our associate pastor, Garcia. Some of you may not have heard, his nephew passed away suddenly at the age of 20 this past Monday. He was raised by a single mother who was not even able to travel. The baby, the children were in Nicaragua when he passed away. And so, without giving any more details, just letting you know that we as a church would assist the family in Nicaragua as they're mourning the loss and as they had to bury a young person this past week. So please also uplift Pastor Garcia in your prayers. Thank you. <laughs> 